Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's June 10th, 2020, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. We're facing unprecedented environmental crises these days, from global warming to catastrophic loss of biodiversity. These things aren't happening in a vacuum, though, so on today's episode of the Manga Bay Newscast, we're going to take a look at how these environmental crises intersect with two of the other major crises we're facing right now the COVID pandemic, and the systemic racism and police brutality that have sparked protests around the world in recent weeks. We welcome two guests onto the program today. Leela Haza is the founder and executive director of Lion Guardians, a conservation organization dedicated to finding ways for lions and humans to coexist. Founded in 2007 in Kenya, Lion Guardians has seen so much success that it now has operations in several other countries and other continents. Hazza joins us today to discuss how the COVID pandemic has impacted Lion Guardian's community-based conservation work and what she sees as opportunities for transformative change in conservation due to the pandemic. We're also joined by Aaron McGee, a herpetologist and science communicator who helped organize the first ever Black Birders Week, a week-long celebration on social media of black birders and nature lovers. McGee was one of several black scientists who organized Black Birders Week in response to the racial profiling and threats of police violence that a white woman directed at Christian Cooper, a black man and avid birder, while he was in a popular birding spot in New York City's Central Park. The incident was witnessed by millions of people around the world thanks to a viral video that sparked a massive outcry. Later that same day, George Floyd was killed by police in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which has led to weeks of protests across America and the world. McGee tells us how Black Birders Week came together so quickly and why it was necessary to celebrate black nature lovers. I want to see more black undergrads all in natural resources, nature, birding, conservation in general. Because if nothing else, Black Birders Week proved that the interest is there. It's not us that are preventing us from being there. We like we want to be here. We want to do this work. We want to recreate but the barriers are in the way. So I want to see academics and all these different agencies and stuff actively work to tear down these barriers. The murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers on May 25th was the catalyst for ongoing protest against police brutality and entrenched systemic racism in more than 50 countries around the world. The courage and passion of the protesters is all the more on display given that they're out in the streets demanding justice even while the global pandemic continues to worsen. The coronavirus has been detected in virtually every country on the planet. More than 7 million people have caught the virus and more than 405,000 have died. And there's no signs of infection slowing down as Sunday, June 7th saw more than 136,000 new cases, the highest number of new infections recorded in a single day so far. Lockdown orders and travel restrictions put in place to control the spread of the disease have curtailed the efforts of many larger international conservation NGOs, but because Lion Guardians is a community-based conservation organization, their work has not suffered such setbacks. Here's Leela Haza on the founding mission of Lion Guardians. I started doing research in about 2005 in southern Kenya near um, Amboseli, near, near Mount Kilimanjaro. The reason I started that research was because the rate of lion killing was very high. You know, we're talking 50, 60 lions being killed a year and in not a very big area. And it wasn't really, there was no, there was no uh, decline in, in, in the future uh, that, that we suspected. So we, we, we knew that we had to do something if we wanted to try to rescue the population in that area and, and really get that population to rebound. Um, and so through the work that we were doing, we recognized that if we really wanted to reduce lion killing, stabilize the lion population, we, we, we needed to work with the communities. And so we chose to work with the, the group that was responsible for the lion killing, the lion killers themselves, and, and really you know, use their, their, their traditional knowledge of their environment, their, their passion for being outdoors, and also their, um, their traditional role as, as a warrior in their community to protect their community, to, to, to kind of put that toward conservation instead of killing lions, and it's worked. I mean, it's worked amazingly. We have almost seven times the number of lions that we had 10 10 years ago. We have been able to reduce lion killing by more than 90% in this this ecosystem. And so it's, it's been a hugely rewarding experience. The success of Lion Guardians is all the more impressive given that they do not work in protected areas, such as the nearby Amboseli National Park. 
Their model for reducing human-wildlife conflict is now being put to use in several other African countries as well as farther abroad. The area that really interests us is kind of the interface between wildlife and people. Um, so, so working outside of the national parks, uh, Amboseli Savo is quite a big uh, national park system in southern Kenya. So we work in the communities, the Maasai communities around there. And yeah, about three or four years after we started really showing success, then other organizations in Africa wanted to, to start using this, a similar model to, to see if they, could get, um, if they could also reduce lion killing in those vicinities outside of, of these protected areas. And so we did. We expanded to, uh, with, through partners um, in a couple of different sites in Tanzania, um, Zimbabwe, uh, a couple of other countries in Africa, um, and then just more more recently, we've been sharing the model now uh, with 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 an organization in India who's who's working with tigers and leopards, um, and then and then more recently in South America with jaguars, and that that's really cool for us to see the value about um, you know sharing that knowledge and seeing how we can have similar impacts in other spaces, even with other species. As the COVID pandemic disrupted daily life and brought economies to a standstill around the world. Many conservation groups had to reduce their operations, but not lion guardians. One of the biggest things with COVID is that it's really highlighted the importance of the work that we do in other grassroots and community-based organizations. So unlike the big NGOs, you know, who've pretty much stopped operating actually because they're either based in Nairobi and, you know, Nairobi has been in lockdown, so people can't leave. And they're also very reliant on on expats. So these community-based organizations, you know, they're primarily composed of teams that come directly from the communities and they're working in those areas, right? So, so gross, grassroots organizations like Lion Guardians, they become really essential now. These communities are, 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 are being heavily impacted with loss of revenue that used to come from tourism or other conservation activities, yet they're still experiencing daily loss of livestock. I mean, of course, Lions aren't going to stop eating cows just because it's COVID. So they're still choosing to continue to share that space with wildlife. So I would say with such few organizations still operating, I mean, it's been kind of incredible to see how many, I mean, there's, there's literally just us and pretty much one other organization that's operating right now. We've had to not only increase our kind of conflict mitigation work on the ground, and of course, <laughs> unfortunately, COVID has coincided with the rainy season, which also you know, results in higher conflict with wildlife during the season. So that's happening at the same time. Plus, we're providing kind of more health care support to communities um, because we're concerned about how quickly COVID will spread in the Maasai communities. And unfortunately, actually, yesterday we got our first positive case in the ecosystem. It's, it's, been, it's actually we're really worried. And, and I think it's been contained, but it's something that we're, we're, we are really worried about. And then, of course, on top of that, just like as an NGO, as a nonprofit, I would say about two months ago, there was kind of this big, you know, general consensus in the NGOs communities that, you know, everybody has to reduce salaries, operating costs, uh, funds would be limited. Um, the, you know, the, the economic market is doing very poorly. So people need to really limit, you know, their, their operating costs. And I would say like my sense is, sense is about 75% of NGOs in Kenya probably did cut salaries um, and operations. I think we've actually just increased our field staff because I, I feel that our work is even more critical right now because there are such few of us on the ground. Um, we're also pretty confident in our approach Uh, We're confident in in the impact that we know we can have on the ground. Uh, We're confident about the strong relationship that we have with the local communities on the ground and also our donor community. Um, But really, at the end of the day, we feel that, you know, I think this is the time to invest in the communities and provide support right now, because it is this this uncertainty and the unknown is is really difficult Lion Guardians has actually been designated as an essential service so that they can continue to pursue their work. The Kenyan Wildlife Service through the government has given us that that recognition so we are able to continue to move around. Um, Even during curfew, we can move around, we can continue to do our work. And that's been very important. I think without that, uh, we wouldn't be able to, you know, ramp up the efforts um, so smoothly. Hazza says there are many other ways that the pandemic actually presents opportunities for transformative change in conservation. It's like, well, we could turn it on the positive, uh, and I think conservation needs that. Um, so, I mean, first, just kind of you just brought up essential services. So I think, I think conservation has always been kind of a secondary issue 
or you know, people don't believe it as, as, as important as things like education or health. But now that it has been deemed an essential part, you know, essential service or an essential thing by the government in Kenya and also other African countries, that's a pretty huge deal. And just for example, I would say, that, and I was just on a, on a phone call with, with, with one of my colleagues the other day, and she was telling me that the Kenyan government in their new stimulus package that just came out, they allocated 2 billion shillings to the environment, which is about $20 million, which is kind of the first time ever that they've actually allocated that much money to the environment in one go. Um, so I think the opportunity there is that we need to capitalize on maybe prioritizing or reframing our environment as essential. So as a conservationist, we need to really think about how to do that. I think another opportunity is around uh, the importance of inclusion and diversity in conservation. So, you know, due to COVID, I think we're all learning how to do <laughs> most things virtually now. You know, these big convenings and meetings around the world, they, they often lack representation from places like Africa. I mean, obviously it, it costs a lot of money to travel and fly to these meetings. Visas are difficult to secure, but now I would say more and more Africans are speaking at these international forums because things are virtual. So I would say, I guess my hope in that is that we continue to utilize technology, virtual spaces, um, to have more diverse voices at these important convenings. And obviously, we can, you know, be kinder to our environment by limiting our carbon footprint at the same time. I mean, I, I, like, I would say for me personally, I, I'm on a plane every month, right? And I never like doing that. I, I'm thrilled to not be traveling so much. And also, I think women, women have been left out of many of these important conversations because they're not able to travel with, you know, with things like childcare and other responsibilities. But now we're seeing more and more women come to these, these virtual tables and, and fully participate. And I think I couldn't really leave out the opportunity to state that, you know, without a doubt right now, the current situation has shown us that, that female leaders around the globe, they're, they're outperforming men against the corona um, virus response, you know, and, and, that, and that's, I mean, if you're looking at all the countries that are being led by women, I mean, they're doing excellent, right? And well, well it's, it's not like it's, it's news because it's been really well documented in a lot of literature that women are, they're, they're very democratic, they're, they're, they're very collaborative. You know, they're compassionate communicators. Um, they're inclusive. These, you know, th these are all traits that, that we need in conservation, you know. And so it's like one way that, that we're supporting that uh, or, you know, supporting kind of women's leadership in conservation is, is through an initiative that's, uh, that's really close to my heart called Women for the Environment or We Africa, which is focused on, on developing more uh, gender equity at, at the highest uh, environmental leadership positions in Africa. And so I'm really excited about this because I think that's, we, we do need more women in these spaces. If you think about the kind of the highest leadership positions in Africa, less than 5% of them are held by women. That, that needs to change. Um, and so we're hoping to launch this in the next couple of months. Another opportunity that the pandemic has given rise to is simply having the time to sit and reflect on what's working and what's not working in conservation, Hazza says. A lot of the collaborators that I work with and a lot of the meetings I've had recently, we're actually talking a lot about opportunity because most of us are always on the move. So like right now we're not. So we can actually stop and think, right? So I think, you know, crisis does create opportunity to be introspective and to actually sit and think about all the things we've learned over the years. And I think one thing that we've learned as conservationists is to be resilient. Um, you know, most of us, are on the front lines dealing with real and immediate threats all the time. We don't really have many breaks. And so to me, that res resiliency is our gift um, going into COVID. However, uh, you know, while we're kind of busy putting out fires all the time, we haven't necessarily prioritized like that pausing function. We're not very good at that as, as, conserva as conservationists. Or, or because when you pause, you're also creating a space to be innovative, right? So things like um, fresh ideas, like intelligent risk taking, um, you know, well thought out models with clear metrics. Metrics is a whole another thing that's really missing in our space. Those things are essential if we want to have these kind of lasting environmental impacts. So to me, that those are like huge opportunities that we wouldn't necessarily have. It, without this, this pandemic that we're in right now. 
There's growing awareness of the value of community-based conservation models. And as Lion Guardian's experience shows, the pandemic is demonstrating just how resilient those models are. It's what we've been trying to, to save for the last 20 plus years. And now it's the opportunity to really showcase the value of community-based organizations. Um, you know, I think there is, especially in Southern Africa, but across the continent and, and other places in the world, there's always that assumption that, you know, if you pay for it, it stays. So things like tourism or hunting or, you know, you, you have to pay for it and then, and then it works, uh, you know, or, or having a really big NGO that has like 10 vice presidents and then you have that structure that can keep things stable, but it's not working. None of those sectors are functioning right now, right? So what is functioning? Are communities running conservation? That's what's happening. And that's why wildlife is, are, are, they're thriving, they're doing well. I mean, another great thing that's coming out of COVID, COVID for nature is that, I mean, I don't think we've seen wildlife this happy in a really long time. I mean, they're really doing well um, in a lot of these areas because there's, 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 there's no tourism, there's nobody there. They're able to move around much freely, much more free. And so it's 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 such a it's such a great time to really showcase the value of, of grassroots organizations, um, and and I'm hoping that as we continue to move forward in, in the conservation space, that we start to recognize that during pandemics, during exceptional times, the most resilient organizations are the, these organizations that are, that are community based, and we start investing into those organizations for the long haul. Systemic racism and police brutality aren't just issues here in the United States, of course. Hazaz says that she and her colleagues have had the opportunity to have conversations about how they as conservationists can help address some of these inequalities in society at large. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that it's definitely not just a, um, a U.S. issue right now. Um, a lot of the forums, I'm on, I'm on a lot of different kind of WhatsApp groups. One of them is, is a group of um, women across Africa in, in the conservation space. Uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, 30 different countries. Like it's, it's really well represented. And this is a conversation we've been having for the last week, right? That it's not what's happening in America has been happening in, in Africa too, right? P police brutality, it's happening here. Um, you know, the injustices that are occurring are not just... Uh, you know, play space there. And it's something that it's kind of given us an opportunity to have discussions that maybe we wouldn't have, you know, and again, that, that, that COVID's given us that time to have these conversations. So um, it's something uh, we're actually, you know, interested in writing some papers about this from a conservation perspective. Um, and, 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 and hence why I brought up even the, this kind of idea of essential services, because you know, we've never had the opportunity to consider the environment as essential in Africa, right? And, and here's that opportunity. And so how do we bring that into that space? How, how do we ensure that there are more women into that space? That, that race comes up, discussions around race comes up, but it's done in a, in a safe space and in a compassionate way so it's productive, right? And what does that look like in Africa? It, doesn't, it, it may be a totally different way that it's done elsewhere, but how can we set up those systems so that we can have those conversations and turn it into something that's positive? Conversations about race are particularly important to have here in the U.S. as well, of course. Nothing showed that more clearly than when Christian Cooper, a black man who was out in the Ramble section of Central Park in New York City, asked a white woman to put a leash on her dog, as she was required to do by law. The woman, whose name is Amy Cooper, no relation to Christian Cooper, obviously, responded by telling Christian Cooper that she was going to call the police and tell them that an African-American man was threatening her and her dog. And then that's exactly what she did. She called the police and, in a hysterical tone of voice, attempted to weaponize the police against a black man. We know this happened because Christian Cooper caught the whole thing on video. Most of us see nature as a refuge from the ills of society, but here was a glaring example of how, even when out in nature, black people can be subjected to racism and state-sanctioned violence by white people who want to claim the space for themselves. Aaron McGee is part of a group of black people working in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, who saw Christian Cooper's video, which quickly went viral, and decided to organize Black Birders Week in response. We've been in this group chat for a long time now, and so we kind of know each other even though we most of us have never met each other and so we all have like this kind of shared experience of being black and experiencing anti-black racism in our daily lives and while we're in the outdoors and things like that and so we really 
felt affected by what was going on. And so we were like, well, we see that, you know, something needs to happen and we really want to see people in academia speak up about these issues and actually make some change. So we need to do something. And so we were like, well, we need time is of the essence. This just happened. We see like stuff kind of like bubbling. Let's just go ahead and get some, let's just go ahead and put something out now. And then that's kind of how Blackbirders Week came into being where we were like, there's a need. We need to go ahead and act on it as quickly as possible. And just the response of it and everything and how big it got was, that was pretty amazing. We, I think we were all surprised by their response. Black Birders Week was designed to celebrate the simple but somehow still radical idea that black birders and black nature lovers in general exist and belong in the great outdoors as much as anyone else. We had a couple of different activities th throughout the week. So we kicked it off with um, Black in Nature. So it was just uh, where people could like post themselves and doing their work or just enjoying nature outside. They didn't have to be a birder or anything. Um, but it's just like a, a an appreciation day for everyone Black who loves to be outdoors and loves nature. And then we went on to post a bird. So essentially anybody could participate. You just post your favorite bird and some uh, fun facts about birds. Um, on Wednesday, it was an uh, break day but I still did instead of doing my find that lizard game I did find that bird then we had a couple of live streams one with Christian Cooper and then one with Dr. Drew Lanham and then the final day was a follow day where you would follow black women who bird and we celebrated people in the LGBTQ plus community and so it was we really tried to make sure that we included everyone while also staying on topic of uh, blackbirding. Blackbirders Week achieved such high visibility, it's incredible to find out that it wasn't something that had been planned long in advance. It was essentially a spontaneous outpouring of black people who are birders or just who love being out in nature, making their voices heard, letting the world know that they exist and are asserting their right to exist in the great outdoors. McGee says that the intent of her and her fellow organizers of Blackbirders Week was to increase the visibility of black birders and Black outdoors people, people who like, you know, in the environment and nature and that type of thing. And we wanted to show other people, other Black people, that there is a community that they aren't alone because it can be like really isolating when you're at like your university or you're going to these major scientific conferences. And a lot of the times you're the only Black person in the room or one of very few. And so it was just a way to like, to bring people together and let them know that they aren't alone. And then finally, we want it for our academic peers to see us and recognize us and, you know, understand that these aren't events that don't touch science or academia. Like these of current events that happen to Black people happen to scientists. And so they need to be more committed and they need to be more vocal and they need to be you know, doing more to affect change. And so we wanted that message to get passed along as well, where it's like, if this affects us, it affects you because we're all scientists. For many of us, myself included, being out in nature is a calming, restorative experience. But racism is so pervasive in our society that that's not automatically true for black people and other people of color when they venture outdoors. It's always something that you have to have in the back of your head. A lot of times, like for me personally, like, it's back there, but I do try to like enjoy myself when I'm out in nature, but I also have to be aware of the area that I'm going to and how I present myself. Like I need to make sure that I'm like, I try to, you know, wear all my gear. Like I have actual hiking boots. I have stuff that's labeled REI and I come decked out so people know that, you know, I'm out here because I actually am interested in nature or even like when I'm doing field work. So I, my work is in the Chiricahua Mountains in uh, southeastern Arizona. So we're on the border of Arizona, Mexico and New Mexico. And I have I take undergraduate students with me. And so I have to be cognizant of, you know, border patrol, depending on, you know, what my students look like, how my students identify in just being aware that when it's me and a couple, you know, black and brown kids out there, Border Patrol is going to look at us a little bit differently than how they look at like the white researchers. And so um, 
even like just doing trying to do my job and that's like kind of the point of it is like no matter what we do no matter where we are no matter who we are if you know if we physically present a certain way we have to have all these different precautions and have like all these extra worries and baggage on us. McGee says that she's gotten into birding after going out with some friends who are birders, but she herself is a herpetologist working on a PhD at the University of Arizona. I always wanted to work with animals and like as a kid, like I was really into horses. I was like, oh, I think I want to work with like elephants or wolves or something like that. And then um, I went to Howard University for undergrad and um, I did this program uh, that was like a pre-professionals program. So it was really for like pre-med, pre-dental, pre-law, stuff like that. But I was, but they like kind of like, were like, oh, well, you want to be pre-vet, so we'll we'll let you in. And I was really the only person kind of interested in that. And so uh, one of my mentors during the program introduced me to my undergraduate advisor, George Minendorf. And so my freshman year, I started working in his lab. And then um, he worked with lizards. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm working with lizards now. And then I got to do this program called the Environmental Biology Scholars. And so that was a two-year program that pretty much funded students to do field work and lab work. And so I got to go out to the Chiricahuas for the first time um, right after I finished my freshman year and do field research with lizards. And I was like, yeah, I like this. I can I can keep doing this for a career. And that's kind of how I got into herpetology. Herpetology picked me. I didn't pick herpetology, but it's fine. I love it. As Leela Haza also alluded to earlier, the fields of environmental science and conservation are sorely lacking in diversity. McGee explains that there are actually a number of barriers to people of color getting involved in science and conservation. So there's quite a few. So you have like lack of knowledge about careers and opportunities. You have lack of resources and getting out into wilderness places where they can have experiences, whether as children or adults. So like not being able to have take time off of work to take your kids to go hiking or something or not having resources to get the proper equipment. There's barriers of feeling like you don't belong in certain areas because if you look at like the history of you know our forests and park systems, black people weren't or and people of color in general weren't allowed to recreate in those areas. You have other barriers when it comes to who gets to go to college or go to grad school who was seen as knowledge holders and people who are worth contributing to a body of knowledge. So there's a lot of uh, barriers out there. Um, And part of my research is that I'm interested in how some of these barriers affect uh, Black people and Black women specifically. Events like Black Birders Week can help begin to address this lack of diversity in science fields, McGee says. Yeah, I feel like Black Birders Week gives Black people permission to go out and just stare at a tree hoping a bird, a cool bird will land there for, you know, five hours or something. Because, you know, a lot of a lot of times people are just like, oh, well, Black people don't go outside or Black people don't go camping and this, that and the other. And when in fact, like, it's not like a white thing to do. It's just that we've just historically been excluded from these types of activities. So it's easy to forget that Black people have, you know, historically been cowboys and ranchers and natural historians and conservationists and all those types of things in the past and still are today. And so just giving people that permission, just showing them that, yeah, other Black people are doing it. You don't have to feel weird. You don't have to feel like like you're any less Black for doing these activities. Ultimately, what I'd really like to see is actual systematic and structural change. When I walk into a a a conference or something, I want to see more Black people. If I'm sitting down with my department and we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I say, hey, how about you include more Black people and people of color in your uh, syllabus? I don't want to hear, well, I only want to include the best because that implies for that, for whatever reason, that Black people can't be the best. I want to see more 
black faculty members. I want to see more black people at the head of these federal state nonprofit organizations. I want for black people to get hired. I want to see more black grad students. I want to see more black undergrads all in natural resources, nature, birding, conservation in general, because if nothing else, Black Birders Week proved that the interest is there. It's not us that are preventing us from being there. We like we want to be here. We want to do this work. We want to recreate, but the barriers are in the way. So I want to see academics and all these different agencies and stuff actively work to tear down these barriers. You might have heard McGee mention her game Find That Lizard, which she modified to Find That Bird for Black Birders Week. Find That Lizard is actually an ongoing thing, so in case you're interested in herps as well. Find That Lizard is a game that I run um, under my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook handles, Afro underscore Herper. Um, It's a game where I post a picture of a lizard camouflaged in its natural environment So then people have to find the lizard somewhere within the picture. And so normally a couple of hours before, I'll post a reference tweet that gives some information, either the it's just fun facts or their hints about where the lizard might be hidden in the picture. And then when I post a challenge photo, that also has either fun facts or hints about the lizard in there. And it's a way that I can teach people about lizards while having fun and hopefully get them to have a greater appreciation for a group of animals that people don't traditionally really like that much. If you enjoy the Manga Bay newscast, we ask that you please consider becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news organization, so just a dollar or more per month will really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. Supporters at the $10 a month level also get access to our members-only insider content. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash manga bay. And don't forget you can subscribe to the Manga Bay newscast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And of course you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. If you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash manga bay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at manga bay on both of those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Grecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.